Thank you for coming to Identifying Monoids. Uh, my name is Ben Dean. I'm a sometime speaker at conferences. I used to be in the games industry. Now I'm in the finance industry. Good to be back at C++ now again. The sort of starter for this talk was a couple of talks I gave last year, or I should say maybe yeah, a couple of talks, actually. I gave the talk on uh, declarative style, and at CPCon I gave a talk on operator overloading. And uh, sorry, can you hear me? Yes? And I got questions. It, it, as a, in doing those talks, I had a slide that said, identify your monoids. And I got questions from people in the audience saying, how should we identify monoids? And I made this claim that if you're an author of code, if you, as a writer of a library, identifying monoids is the single best thing you can do to help users of your library. I actually believe it's also the best thing you can do to help yourself think about the macro level structure of your code. Because as I hope to show in this talk, when we recognize monoids, it's sort of like the macro level equivalent of not doing raw loops. So many of us, many of us have seen Sean Parent's talks uh, maybe some of us are accustomed to code reviews where we think where we spot raw loops and say that could be an algorithm. Spotting monoids is at a larger scale, I think, similar to similar to that. And uh, when you have monoids identified in your code, the user of your code or your library, which you know includes yourself six months down the line, just has to uh, have this one idea that they understand accumulation or the monoidal structure. <coughs> so just as preliminary, let's get this out of the way. I don't know if anyone's particularly confusing monoid and monad. You hear a lot about monads these days, monadic optional or monadic future, especially in C++. Uh, how many people in the audience, by the way, are already familiar with monoids, uh, would say they know and love them? OK, a few hands. That's good. Uh, this isn't a talk. Most of my talks are not uh, full of mathematics. I'm probably going to say some things which mathematicians will take issue with. Gashba, you can take it up with me later. I'll be interchangeably using the terms fold, accumulate, reduce. Uh, but I'm, I'm going to try to ground this talk in examples. So just to give you uh, some a, a context, before I show the examples, here's the context to understand them. And I'm sometimes going to use loose language. I'll say oh, x is a monoid. When I, more correctly, I would say x is form a monoid under some operation. But a monoid is basically three things. You've got a set of values. And that set in computer science usually is finite. But it might be a finite approximation to a conceptually infinite set in mathematics. You've got a binary operation, which is closed over the set. So when you, when you put two elements in, you get the thing of the same type out. And it, that operation has to be associative. Notably, it doesn't have to be commutative. That's kind of an optional add-on. And there's one special value in the set, which is the identity. So that's sort of the context. We're going to go through lots and lots of examples. Because in this talk, I want to give you a sense for spotting monoids in the wild and an intuition for knowing where they might be lurking in your code. So before we get into that, Purple's a comment, so don't worry, you don't need to see those. Uh, this is, I always have problems with comments. I tried this year to make it more. <coughs> anyway, if you were reviewing this code, if I came to you with this code and I said, that I should say to you, this code is perfect, right? I'm going to put this in your main line. What would you say to me? What is this code doing? Do you see any problems? Does anything obviously spring to mind? Does anything obviously spring to mind? Side Sorry? It does have side. Yes, the idea of this is I'm in, implementing a drag and drop in my UI, right? I'm taking this element, putting it in a new place. And somebody said the magic words, Connor. Yes, you've all seen C++ seasoning, or many of you have seen C++ seasoning. This is, <laughs> this is a rotate, right? Sorry? I didn't quite hear that. I said it's wasteful with pop back and insert. It's wasteful with pop back and insert. There's actually a bug on this slide as well. Um, if the if the drop index is before the start index, it's fine. 
But if it's after, then by, by popping back, we've like shifted everything down one, so the drop index isn't correct anymore. This, this code has a bug. This is obviously a rotate, as several of the people said, in the, several people in the room said. Now, you're used to spotting these things, and you're used to code reviewing. We're all experts. How did you know this was a rotate? Connor, how did you know this was a rotate? That's just what rotate does. We can't really say anything more than that, because these are the hallmarks of expertise. You, you know that you know it, but you don't really know how you know it. You just have a spidey sense when you look at code. <coughs> Everyone here is a C++ expert. A C++ novice looking at a code probably wouldn't even know where to start. And there's a great uh, talk that I saw recently by Katrina Owen called Cultivating Instinct, where she talks all about this idea. So how do we build intuition? I gave you the context slide at the beginning of the talk, but we don't really build intuition by just learning the mathematical facts. I mean, Wikipedia is great, but you go to Wikipedia and you look at Monad, it'll tell you everything that's, or Monoid even, it'll tell you everything that's correct, and you'll come away none the wiser. You'll be like, I knew all those words, but I didn't understand how they apply to my code. So to that end, I want to show you lots and lots of examples, because your brain, every brain in this room, will see these examples and form its own pattern recognition pathways. <clears throat> and once you have that sense for, that spider sense for what's a monoid, where might a monoid be lurking in your code, then it can be useful to fill in more, more theory. All right, let's start with the obvious examples. Now, I know all of you have known about monoids since you were in grade school because we learn addition. <clears throat> and every grade school child knows that when you add two integers, you get an integer, even if they don't know the word integer. They know that it doesn't matter what order they add them up in, they still get the right answer. So they know about associativity. And they know that if they add zero to anything, it doesn't change. So addition on the integers with the identity of zero forms a monoid. Similarly, multiplication on the integers, and I put real numbers here, so real numbers, integers, natural numbers, complex numbers, all of these numeric sort of types that, that sort of grow in power. <coughs> Multiplication and addition are the basic monoids that you just run into early in life. Now, as numbers, so many things that are number-like, and, and this represents sort of an approximate, you know, mathematical education as you go from grade school through high school through, well, this probably only goes up to high school. <clears throat> so we can use any of these with accumulate or fold expressions and plus and multiply. So a complex number in particular is, is a pair in the complex plane. Uh, addition would be member-wise. Multiplication is easier to think about in terms of, uh, if you think a complex number in terms of its polar representation. So magnitude and angle. Uh, to, to multiply complex numbers, you would multiply the magnitudes and sum the angles. Now, uh, vectors in the mathematical sense are sort of interesting. We can do member-wise addition, and that forms a monoid. But as far as I'm aware, there's no real multiplication for vector, because the, the inner product, the dot product, isn't closed. You get a scalar. <coughs> and the cross product doesn't have an identity because the vector you get is always at right angles to the other two, the cross product in, in three dimensions or potentially more dimensions. And matrix multiplication is the first thing really that we come across in our mathematical career that is not commutative. So it's interesting in that sense. Anyway, any of these are, are monoids. <coughs> We're still in sort of numeric mode here. The next thing uh, that we come across all the time are the min and max operations. So if you think about it, max, max is a monoid on the positive integers, where uh, 0 is the identity, and you know, the operation is just max. And, and in mathematics, obviously, the integers go on forever. Min is less clear in maths, but in computer science, we work in a finite space. So we can often use numeric limits max to be the identity. And both of these sort of have mirror images. In, in, so 
if you, if you flip negative, right? So I put positive integers at max, similarly negative integers at min, and the other way around for, for min and numeric limits. So different type of numbers would be Boolean values. Now there's a reason why the unary, in a unary fold, the, identi the identity or the thing you get in a unary fold is the identity for that operation over the Booleans. So C++ allows us to use logical and and or in unary folds uh, for that reason. And the value we get with an empty pack there for and is true because that's the identity for the and monoid over Booleans. And the value for the empty pack in the or case is false because same reason, that's the identity for Booleans <coughs> with or. Now there is, another, there is another monoid on Booleans and that's exclusive or. In C++ we don't have a logical, a logical exclusive or operator, we do have the bitwise one. And for exclusive or the identity, as you can see from the table, is actually false. You can see that if false is combined with anything, it doesn't change what it's combined with. So on either side, we get true. And the first one is false. And exclusive or is the same as not equal to, uh, which is, I don't know, I found that non-intuitive, but because you don't think of, when you're thinking about bitwise operations, you don't think of that, but it, it is. So <coughs> that's equivalent. All right, that's just the very simple monoids to start with. Let's take a look at a bit of code and uh, some, some algorithms that you might run into when, when there is a monoid lurking. Again, there are some obvious ones. These are almost a dead giveaway, fairly obvious to spot. And if you see these in your code, you almost certainly have some kind of monoidal structure. Um, all of the algorithms in numeric, just about, uh, accumulate and reduce are the very obvious ones because they are, they are actually, you know, the monoid operations, sort of thing. And fold expressions are the are the language equivalent of accumulate and reduce, if you like. Now, as well as those, there's some other sort of usual suspects. If you were in Connor's talk this morning, you will recognise these. He he called these out as being basically equivalent to accumulates or reductions. <coughs> Any of, all of, none of, they're all built on find. And we've just seen the Boolean monoids, and that's basically the same, the same thing as find. <coughs> find, of course, gives us short circuiting, which we don't get with, with an accumulate, uh, and, but uh, they're still monoids. It's useful to know these are fundamentally monoidal because it tells us that we can compute them incrementally or in a distributed way. I'll have a lot more on that later in the talk. And uh, count, count has the structure where, where we repeat the operation we're applying is increment. We're repeatedly applying increment. So yeah, con if you saw Connor's talk right before lunch, it sort of it feeds into mine quite nicely. Now, the standard library is a bit lacking when it comes to, or I should say, a bit inconsistent when it comes to um, it, its algorithms. Uh, some algorithms have iterator pair versions, and some have iterator and count versions. But not all do, and in particular, none of, them, none of the numeric algorithms do. And I've found this very, very useful. I've found it useful to have an, a formulation of accumulate that is not an iterator pair version, but an iterator and count version. So note here um, that it's basically the same as the iterator pair version except in its return value, pretty much, uh, because the principle of useful return tells us we should, if we've got iterator and n, we should really return the iterator that we counted up to. And that idea is in elements of programming. So this particular thing, this particular accumulate n, I have found useful in sort of sliding window type calculations, where you know, you, you know, you know you've got a size of the window, you want to accumulate the window, and then you want to slide the window as you go. Both of those are, I mean, that's fundamentally monoidal. Uh, there's another useful, uh, uh, useful reformulation of Accumulate that I used in my 2016 talk. I gave a CPPCon talk. It was called Accumulate Exploring an Algorithmic Empire. 
And as part of that talk, I had a lot of fun re-implementing the standard set of algorithms all in terms of some form of fold or accumulate. And I used this formulation of accumulate to do a lot of those. Now, this is exactly the same as standard accumulate, except that I don't dereference the iterator before passing it to the operation. And by doing that, I was able to actually accumulate not just on the values, but also on the iterators themselves. And by doing that, I was able to implement four-fifths of the algorithms in the standard library, basically just with this one algorithm. Any comments, questions, observations up till now? Good. All right. Let's see some more examples. So we've covered numbers. We've covered Booleans. They're fairly easy. You probably know them already. Um, here's another one you might know, but it's a different sort of flavor of things. So this is one that, in particular, is not commutative. Strings form a monoid under concatenation, and the identity is the empty string. This is sometimes called, if, you, if you're familiar with functional programming terms, this is sometimes called the free monoid. Um, there's nothing particularly free as in gratis about it, or even as in sort of free software foundation free. But it's, it's, it's sort of the pure monoid, right? So it's not, it's not uh, commutative. It's only got the power that a monoid requires and nothing else. So it's free in that sense. Thank you, Gashba. It doesn't have quotient relations over it. That's what you find, I suspect, if you go to Wikipedia. <laughs> so yeah, it only, has, it only has the basics, nothing else. Now, there are lots of stringish applications of monoids that we can, that we can think about. <coughs> we can accumulate into a string. Now, that usually is not very well performing. Because you know string temporaries and building up strings is not something you want to do on a value basis. <clears throat> we don't just write string plus string plus string plus string because the compiler doesn't have an efficient way to look through all that copying of strings. But we can do things like outputting strings to a stream and get that performance back. And think about that in the same way as we think about the, the, the monoid structure. So what's actually happening here, the way I like to think of this, is that conceptually, it's a projection function from whatever type we have into a string. That's what the output operator on that type is doing. It's making it into a string. And then we're accumulating it into a string in the real world, which is the, the stream. That's the way I, I think about this. And of course, in boost, we've got uh, join. This is the variant of join. This is not boost join, but this is the variant of join that I use in my code. It's a formulation that I like. So to think about it that way, it actually takes a projection function, my join, and a separator. And as you can see, it's got you know iterator pair and output iterator. So this is join is really a reduction style operation, an accumulation. Uh, we're reducing over the map, outputting the string. Uh, here's the is a type signature for join. And uh, in C++20, we're getting experimental OStream joiner, which is very, very similar, same sort of idea. And we're getting uh, ranges join, which is different, but, but also a monoidal operation. I should point out at this time that uh, feel free to crit critique my slide code. It is slide where it has, all, it has all compiled at some point in its life, although I've stripped out some extraneous things. Um, I know that you'll spot where I've missed out const expra. That, that's just what people tend to say to me. <coughs> so in, ter in terms of ranges, it, the, the actual monoidal structure becomes clearer because it separates. often ranges separate out projection functions from reduction functions and provide that lazy conversion as we go. All right, so let's do a thought experiment. Take what we've seen so far. And think about how would we design an API uh, to surface the monoid operation, to surface uh, that monoidal structure, which is going to help our users. Uh, the way, and, and I thought about this, and I thought about maybe an animation library and what API I might provide. Now, 
the way I like to identify potential monoids is that whenever I see a binary operation, I think, well, is there an identity here? Is there something that I could, I could use that wouldn't change if I combined it with something else? So there are, there are, in fact, usually many, several or many monoids lurking inside an API like this. So anyone have any ideas about, about a potential animation API? What sort of, what sort of operations would we want to do on animations? Step forward, start, interpolate, compose sequentially, maybe blend two together. OK. Um, yeah, the two interesting ones there to me are, well, composing sequentially is exactly the free monoid that we just saw. Animations are sequences, strings are sequences. You, know, you, you compose them back to back. And the identity in that case is the, the no animation. The animation that has zero length, right? Same thing as strings. It's exactly the same. Now, when we compose animations by blending, then that's another kind of monoidal operation. That's a pointwise composition. Pointwise, well, what might the composition be? The answer is really anything that is itself a monoid. So you know, addition. Addition might not be something that makes a lot of sense in animation, but but some kind of blending, some kind of multiplication, some kind of uh, interpolation, maybe weighted. <coughs> Sorry. Uh, oh yeah, good question. So so let's say I wanted to uh, represent blending as a monoid. So I've got two animations and I blend them together with some with something. What would be the identity? Empty animation. It, it, right, it would be an empty animation, not in the sense of a zero time animation, but in the sense of an animation that contains at all of the time points or, or, or keyframes or whatever I'm using to pointwise sequence, an animation that contains the identity for the particular monoidal operation I'm using to blend. So if that's addition, it would be an animation full of zeros. If that's multiplication, it'd be an animation full of ones. So there's this idea that monoids compose that we're seeing. <coughs> Last year, I gave this example uh, as part of my declarative style talk. And as in building these slides, I realized that this is also a monoid. In fact, this is the free monoid, scheduling. Right? So I want to be able to build a schedule. I want to retry an operation when it fails. You know, this is part of sort of a putative uh, network API. So I've got some, I've got some thing I'm going to try. I want to try it after one second and then repeat it at a, at a, with a random exponential back off and then have a max on that. All of these things are joined together with dot then. All of these things, these parts of the schedule, are themselves schedules, right? And I'm composing them with dot then, which is a member operation, a, a member function here, but it's really a binary operation. It's composing two animations. An alternative to this would be, to, to dot then would be that I could, or in addition to dot then would be, I might choose to overload an operator to do it. I might choose to provide a free function to combine two animations and return a third. There's a, there's a monoid in here that perhaps is hard to see because I use the member function, because we would think of monoids in terms of binary operations. But nevertheless, it's there, and it is exactly the same monoid as we see on strings. <coughs> OK, so all that's fine. Why? I wanted to go back to this idea very briefly when we pause to say why this abstract mathematics idea is somewhat important for programming. Because that, you know, there are people out on Twitter and out in the world who say, mathematics has nothing to do with programming. I'm not interested in finding these abstractions in my code. Uh, you know, I just want to just engineer the code. To them, I would say, you know, yes, you can program without maths, just like you can bake without knowing any chemistry. You're doing it anyway. That's the point. Whether or not you know about monoids doesn't change the fact that they are in your code. 
And so knowing about them should help you to, uh, to write code. And odds are, if you're a good programmer, you already have an intuition for this stuff. Just like if you're a good baker, you have an intuition for chemistry, even if you're not a chemical engineer. Monoids are fundamentally a design pattern, and they are like the design patterns in you know, that 1995 book, Design Patterns. Now, that book had a very particular way of looking at the world. It had a very late 90s, object-orientated, uh, very sort of runtime polymorphism style. And we don't use that style anymore, but nevertheless, we still use those patterns. So when, I set, when, I, when we look at a piece of code and I say to you, I think we could use the visitor pattern here, what I'm, you understand that what I'm suggesting is not let's open design patterns and implement this, this runtime polymorphism double dispatch kind of thing. No, what I'm saying is this is like the visitor pattern because I think we could benefit from the ability to easily add operations rather than types. And it's the same, you know, we can have that same conversation about monoids as a design pattern when we recognize them in our code. <coughs> okay, we've seen sort of prim what I might call primitive monoids on numbers, and we've seen uh, the monoid on strings, concatenation. Let's look a bit deeper at that idea of monoid composition that we, that we saw in that, in that uh, thought experiment for animations. So containers. Right? We've got lots of containers in C++. They are monoids. They are monoids on their value types, by which I mean if their value types form a monoid, then containers also form a monoid. And we can think about this in terms of, well, this is sort of obviously a transform on two vectors. So Connor mentioned transform in his in talk this morning. Other languages call it zip. The monoid here is plus. More interestingly, let's think about maps. Yes? Uh, when you say containers monoids, do you consider uh, the monoid as a container of a given length, uh, like as a separate monoid, or all of the containers of any possible finite and possibly infinite length together? OK, the question was, in saying that containers are monoids, does that mean that a container of a given length forms a monoid with all containers of that length? or that the monoid operates over all containers no matter what length of that type? Both are possible. Both, both are possible. Well, both are possible, and I mean both. <laughs> and in fact, the next slide maybe makes that a bit clearer. Uh, because let's consider maps. So um, like vector, a map is a monoid on its map type. Uh, and it's, so to, is it Georgi? Yeah. To Georgi's point, it, it's easy to see how you would compose two vectors if they have the same length. And in a map, let's think about this example. So Alice and Bob, in Alice worked 80 hours in January, but didn't work in February. Charlie worked 70 hours in February, but didn't work in January. So how are we going to compute the total hours for, from the sort of addition of these maps? Well, we're going to take the union of the keys, if you like. And how can we, but what unlocks that for us is the fact that addition has an identity, right, which is zero. If there were no identity, we wouldn't know how to add these together. Because conceptually, in, Charlie, uh, uh, in January, Charlie worked the identity number of hours, right? And in, and in February, Alice worked the identity number of hours. So, the existence of the identity is the key thing here. So that, I hope, is fairly straightforward and illustrates the point. I've put at the bottom here, as, as, as for maps, so for pure functions. And this is something you find in, in functional languages. And it's something that C++ has sometimes, and maybe it's a good thing to aim for. But if you, if you have a pure function, i.e. a function that doesn't depend on anything other than its inputs, then you can imagine implementing that function as with a, with a map inside it and simply looking up the value of the output by passing the value of the input. So maps and functions are, in some sense, the same. Right? So where a map is a monoid on its mapped type, a function is also a monoid on its output type. I mean, it is all 
It is called map. Right. Legitimate representation of semantics for functions uh, for map is a good function. Uh, sorry. Yes, you have. You make the point that you have you have denotational semantics for maps in terms of functions. Right. So let's look at uh, heterogeneous heter heterogeneous uh, collections, i.e., product types, uh, where the types vary. So here they can still be monoids, but the monoids may vary. Uh, the first the first example here. As I mentioned before, a polar complex number, complex number in, in polar form. <coughs> These, the, the types in the pair could be representationally the same, but the operations, the monoidal operations you want to apply to them may differ. So the operation here is a complex number multiplication. The, the sub-operations, if you like, the monoidal operation you need to, you need to put on each of the uh, elements of the, of the pair differ, because when you multiply a complex number, you multiply their moduli, and you add together their arguments. The second example here shows actually two different types. So almost necessarily, the monoids are different. I mean, if, there was, if they were two numeric types, you might say the, the operation is the same. But in this case, it's a, it's a computation t. It's a function. I've just chosen a simple function from int to int and some kind of time. So we're profiling that function. If we wanted to profile the concatenation of two functions, two functions running sequentially, we would obviously add together the time they took. So the, we've got the additive monoid on the addition monoid on the time. And the monoid on the functions is just uh, function composition, if you like. <coughs> OK. Here is another monoid that comes up all the time. So sets of things are monoidal in, in two different ways. Uh, the more useful one tends to be union. So I have set A and set B, union them together, and set C. Doesn't matter which order I put them together in. Doesn't matter, uh, yeah, it doesn't matter which order, and the identity is the empty set. Uh, similarly for intersection, except that the identity tends to be more difficult to, to represent because it's the universe of all possible things. There's a trick to it. Apparently there's a trick to it. Um, set difference turns one into the other. Gashba says that set difference, you mean turns union into intersection. And vice versa. And so that's how you get away from right. reason Okay, okay. So set difference can help with, with representing the universal set because it can turn the one monoid into the other. The, one of the applications here is collecting, collecting properties, collecting arguments, whatever. So this is actually, Alexander Stepanov tells a story of how, when he, when he realized that mathematical structure was amenable to, to C++ or algorithmic, uh, algorithmic structure. And he, and he tells a story of, I think it was, being in a fever dream or something, and he saw in his mind the structure of accumulate stretching out to infinity and all the associativity and all that stuff. <coughs> I, I have a similar sort of story when I realized, you know, why monoids were so powerful. And I had a similar sort of thing. I was working late one night, and I was, I forget what I was working on, but I, was, I got up to take a break. It was about 7 p.m. Walked around the office to give my legs a bit of a stretch. Uh, and I came to my friend Simeon's desk, and he, he's not a C++ programmer, he's more of a JavaScript programmer by trade, and he was puzzling about how to um, combine some properties that he wanted in some JavaScript objects. He had, he had uh, uh, just an object, which he was treating as a bag of properties. He had several of these objects, and he, he had written a function to, or he had a function that, that was able to combine two objects and put, you know, return the sum of the, the union of their properties. And he was wondering about, you know, he was thinking about, well, I've only got, I've got a whole list of these things, and I only know how to like do two of them at once. And this was the point at which I suddenly realized he was using underscore, the functional JavaScript library at the time. And I, and I, suddenly, I suddenly realized the structure of this. I suddenly realized that what we were doing was union over, over uh, JavaScript objects, which are effectively sets of objects, and uh, you know, just in that 
moment realized that he didn't he didn't need all this complex code. He just needed just his function and the reduce call, in, which was in the underscore library. <clears throat> so one of the places we see that particular monoid coming up a lot is in configuration and ways of dealing with configuration. So let's, let's take an aside to look at this kind of more concrete illustration. So configuration comes in lots of different flavors, uh, often JSON objects, some kind of blobs of configuration. It might be, it might be a, uh, a sort of a not open format, a proprietary format. Sets of command line flags, which we often uh, handle by things like, you know, you read a config file and you get some config. And then maybe you, read, maybe you read first a global config file, and then later on you read a user-specific config file, and you overlay those on the global. And then finally, perhaps, you consider your command line arguments as the highest priority and you overlay those on your config. These are all monoids. In fact, these are all kind of the set monoid that we just saw, the union, the union monoid. The APIs we present for these types of operations seldom recognize the presence of this monoid and seldom allow us to parameterize it fully. So this is from the protobuffer uh, documentation. This is directly from protobuf documentation. It's a, their description of how merging protobufs works. And what they're describing is a monoid hidden down in the protobuffer code, not exposed in the API, and therefore unparameterizable. Parameterizable. So we've got, we've got two, two interesting monoids here. One is just the kind of union of properties, the set union monoid. The other is a replacement, right? So you want to override what you saw before. And that, in a monoidal sense, is sometimes called the last monoid. So the last thing you see is that you just, the operation is just overwriting, overwriting, overwriting. You end up with the last thing that you see. So these monoids are composed together. But the, again, these, yeah, these are buried down in protobuf code. You, you don't get to surface these. You don't get any choice about what happens here. And Protobufs also have this great uh, example of the identity element in, in optional fields. So, you know, I how many people in the room have used protocol buffers? Yeah, a fair amount, probably a little more than half, maybe even two thirds. So you're, you're used to this, you know all about protobufs, um, but perhaps you haven't thought of them monoidally before, and, and certainly these aren't exposed in the API. So having said that, let's look at you know, how C++ supports, supports monoids. So sometimes we have problems with identity. Sometimes we have arity issues. <coughs> a lot of times we like to use value types. And they're great. And they often can represent things well. Sometimes there is no good default constructor. Because sometimes they represent things in the real world. and Maybe there is no good default constructor. Like, there's no real good default constructor for colors. Now you might say, well, black, OK. Or the color that's fully transparent, right. But we, what we'd like is for the default constructor to give us the identity value. The problem is that a monoid doesn't just depend on a type. It depends on an operation. And for that operation, the identity value might be different. And we can't write more than one default constructor. <clears throat> sometimes there's no good choice for a default. And sometimes there's no good choice mapping it to multiple monoids. <clears throat> the other thing we run into sometimes is that the operation itself sometimes has no identity. This is, this is a sort of more serious problem. Um, or it could be the case that. Because of, because of other reasons, because of safety, because you want it to be value-oriented and, and safe, you have tried to uh, narrow your data type so it can't actually express the identity. This is an example of things like you know, null pointers. And you want to just express the identity value in the one place where you want the monoidal property, but you don't want that in your data type as a whole, because you don't want to check everywhere for null pointers or, or such. Um, so. Optional is the thing that helps you here. 
This is an option that you have for making a monoid if you don't have easy access in your type to an identity value. What optional does is give you an extra value outside of your type, and you can use that as the identity. <coughs> so an operation without an identity, uh, an associative operation, is known as a semigroup, uh, with the set, obviously. So that for, if you have no identity in your monoid, then you have a semigroup. You can provide that identity by wrapping an optional. And you can just do that for the place where you need the optional, uh, where you need the, the monoidal operation. So here's the, um, I mentioned protobuf has that overwriting monoid. That's called last. There's an analogous one called first, where you just take the first one. Obviously, it's a very trivial operation. You can see, as it stands with first, or equivalently with last, there is no identity. There is nothing. So for a given y, there is nothing you could pass in as x which would give you back y. It's obvious by looking at the code that can't happen. So this is not a monoid, but if we wrap it in an optional, we get the monoid operation that we want. Now, this is so trivial that we probably don't recognize it actually as an operation or think of the ability to lift it out of code or to provide the ability to parameterize over it. And so that's one of the powers of you know, always thinking in terms of monoids is that even totally trivial operations um, you see them, and, and then you know, it's only a short hop from seeing something that's totally trivial and so trivial that it doesn't even seem like an operation to, to providing the ability to parameterize it and have operations that would more seem like operations. Jens? So <clears throat> this, I've represented on this slide two different operations, but I'm, <laughs> and maybe that was my fault. So, so, so first returns the first thing you pass it. That's obvious. Last, equivalently, returns the, the second thing you pass it. Right? So you can imagine another function called last, which returns the y. Oh, oh yeah. Right, right, right. And, and so imagine this was called first, and, it, and, and swap y's for x's. Same deal. So sorry for the confusing slide, but I just, this slide represents two halves of this, you know, the two monoids. OK, now a monoid is fundamentally a binary operation. So what do you do if you want an enary operation? And this, and this might frequently come up because you want an enary operation for performance. The compiler can't actually see through n binary operations and, and like turn them into an enary operation. Or at least last time I talked to Chandler, the compiler couldn't do that. <laughs> Any hope for the future? Mm, no, maybe not. <clears throat> so you've got some choices to provide enary operations. One thing you can do is overload an operator, and then you'll get fold expressions, which which maybe aren't really enary operations, but at least give 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 you at the call site an enary operation, right? Another thing you can do is make a special type, do some do some dynamic stuff. Um, probably not a favorite with this crowd. Dynamic dispatch is something that's not trending for C++. <clears throat> you can provide a traits class and do generic code. That's effectively the static version of runtime object orientation. It's compile time object orientation. You can do something with concepts, although, and we'll see in a minute, I tried to apply concepts to, to figure out how they might apply to monoids. Concepts are a little bit lacking in C++ for this kind of thing because concepts apply to types. And as we've said, a monoid isn't just a type. In fact, you can have several different monoids on the same type. There are other variations. Um, <coughs> so let's take a look at, I tried to write a generic fold function. And I, this is one way in which I came up, which I came up with. And I'm using traits. So, and I'm using Numeric here is a concept. Uh, you can imagine what it's like. So what I've done here is try to write a generic fold function with, you know, variadic arity. And 
in order to do that, I have made mono traits because, because again, mono doesn't just depend on the type. I want to be able to name the operation. Here I named it multiply. I overrode my mono traits class for a number and the multiply operation. And that's how I define my identity and my monoidal operation. And using this structure, I can write a generic fold function, which just starts with the identity and repeatedly applies the operation. This is one way I could do it. There are probably other ways. As I said, I tried to think about how concepts would fit into this picture. Um, I'd be interested to talk to anyone who has ideas about how this could be improved. <clears throat> but this is, this is not bad, right? This is, uh, this is lifting the monoid out. This is identifying the monoid, tagging it with a name. And this generally would do what, would do what you want. This might get a bit easier. We've got, there's a paper P1219, uh, which is proposing uh, variadic packs with homogeneous uh, types. I don't know how well that paper is progressing, if at all. But I, you know, I'm using a variadic pack here, but really, and you can see this common type thing, which I, I don't really like. Ideally, these things are all the same type because that's the type that you want with your monoid. OK, so that was all thinking about sort of C++, sort of very nitty gritty stuff. I want to think more in the wider world about how monoids apply. And in particular, they are ubiquitous in statistics. And the key that they provide in statistical operations is the ability to distribute and the ability to uh, to distribute computations and to do incremental computations. So think about how we might distribute these things. So back to the properties of monoids, they're closed. What does that give us? That means that that's the key to using bounded space, right? If I'm summing an infinite stream of integers, I don't want to have to represent an infinite amount of memory on my box. The fact that summing is a monoid gives me that bounded space. You know, it might seem closeness is almost so obvious we don't think about it, but it's really important and that's that's the reason, one of the reasons it's important. Associativity is the key to distributing an, a monoid over this is over hardware, right? So you can see that it doesn't matter which order we we query these boxes and sum the results, we're always going to get the right answer. And we can distribute over time as well. So here's a distribution over time. You can see I've represented it as a tree. And if we keep sums at each level of the tree, then we can query any time period in logarithmic time. Because we've got the ability to, hopefully you can see how that works. So you want to, let's say this is the first minute past 12, second minute past 12, et cetera. We, we're, keeping, we're keeping all these sums for individual minutes. Then we would also keep the rolled up sums for every two minutes, every four minutes, every eight minutes, every 16 minutes. This would give us the ability to query in logarithmic time. Let's say we want to get the sum between 1207 and 1215. Um, we can break that down into the powers of two parts and get that sum in logarithmic time. So associativity gets us uh, quite a lot. And the existence of an identity is the key, really, to flexibility in perhaps in operations management. right? If, if I have an identity, then I can bring up a new box. And it doesn't matter that I haven't hooked up the feed to it yet. I can still query it and get a good answer that I can feed in with the rest of my operations. Um, so ident what identity buys us, one of the things, is, is the ability to do piecemeal deployment over distributed hardware. All right, so that's all kind of what the properties give us. Let's see some, uh, some more examples. So instead, I said statistics uh, are ubiquitously monoidal. We've already seen max and min. That's a very simple statistic you might want to compute. And that those are monoids. Similarly, max and min are just it's a short throw from there to top n, because max is just top 1 and min is bottom 1. Similarly, top n, bottom n, 
their monoids. You can imagine how they work because they're just analogous to max and min. Mean is also uh, a monoid. Uh, one way to do that is to store the sum and the count independently, their monoids. And then you just, when you want to retrieve the mean, you just divide through. Uh, this is a popular one, I think, for interview questions. A sliding window rolling average kind of an idea. This is an interview question that was used at Blizzard for several years. And it's basically the application of a monoid, the mean, the mean monoid. Histograms, they're also, so think about what a histogram is. It's a vector of counts. It's a bunch of buckets, each of which have counts in, right? We've already seen how to combine that. So you can imagine how to combine buckets on one machine with buckets on another machine. They're counts. It's a monoid. It's, a, it's monoids all the way down here. <clears throat> we know how to sum them point-wise. And of course, when I say sum point-wise, I mean any monoid operation point-wise. That's what I mean when I say it's monoids all the way down. You can have a histogram of top ends or you know, a histogram of means of top ends or any of these are composable. Connor. Does top n return a list? What's the type signature of top n? Is it the top? Uh, top n, well, I wasn't thinking about it in terms of a function with a type signature, but in terms of you might want to keep a statistic. Yes, if you like, it's an array of 10 things if you want to keep top 10. You know? um, so you have on one machine the top, the top 10 things it's seen, on another machine the top 10 things it's seen. In order to combine those two, you just take the top 10 things of the, the union, right? These are all very simple statistics. There are a lot more uh, complicated ones, and these are some probabilistic algorithms. Uh, Nicholas Ormrod gave a great talk on this in 2017. Fantastic algorithms are where to find them. These are some of the algorithms that he covered. And they're all, they're all probabilistic algorithms. They, they work by keeping relatively small amounts of state. So you've, the, the idea is you've got a stream of things coming into your machine. You've got you know, distributed machines. Each individual machine needs to keep just a relatively small amount of state. And you know how to combine that state with a state from another machine. It forms a monoid. Unfortunately, the Wikipedia page for streaming algorithms doesn't mention monoids, but I'm not sure why. <coughs> So this is, anyone heard of hyperloglog? -log? No, like yeah, yeah, several people at the top, maybe, maybe a quarter of the people in the room. So this is the intuition for hyperloglog. -log. So you can see that it's a monoid. So the idea is, well, the use case for hyperloglog -log is you want to, say, count unique logins to your site, right? So you're going to get a billion logins this week. You want to know how many of them are unique. Now, it's quite prohibitive to naively keep a hash table of logins, because that hash table gets quite large. So the intuition for hyperloglog -log is that if you have a perfect hash function, one of, the, one of the things that you get from that is no collisions and uniform distribution. So if we think about a hash function that just gives us a hash between 0 and 1, after we've seen n hits on that hash, n uniques, we would expect Again, given the hash function is ideal, we would expect uniform distribution of those hits on the hash, which means we would expect the same distance between each of them, and in particular, the same distance between 0 and the lowest one we've seen. And using that, we can recover n, the total number of things we've seen, or an approximation to. You know, In the real world, hash functions aren't ideal, so there's some trickery that goes into, the, into this. But this is the basic intuition for how hyperloglog -log works. And what you do is, like any probabilistic algorithm, you choose how much memory and how much CPU you want to spend to bound your error rate by however much. So you know, uh, you want to, uh, conceptually, you want to use multiple different hashes uh, to spend more CPU, get a, get a better error rate. And there are lots of tricks that go into making hyperloglog, -log, but basically, you can think of it as Keeping, mul keeping multiple hashes, keeping track of the smallest value of each one you've seen, and each machine stores like a register file of that. And then you know how to combine two different files from two different machines because 
the operation here is min. So you know how to combine those two effectively vectors of numbers monoidally with a min operation pointwise. <coughs> and with hyperloglog, log, you can get a, at a very modest cost, you can count billions of uniques with say 99% accuracy. It's very effective. And it's all based on this monoidal structure. That's what's the key to its distribution. Very similar to hyperloglog log is count min sketch. So this is something like a bloom filter, if you're familiar with that. Uh, the idea of count min sketch is you don't just want to count uniques, but you want to say how many times you've seen each unique. So how many times has Alice logged in today? So again, conceptually, we've got three separate hash functions and uh, three separate hash tables, right? So when Alice logs in, we hash Alice three different ways, and we increment the value in each of those hash tables under Alice's hash. And then, and then Bob logs in, and Bob might collide with, Hal with Alice on one of the hashes, but it's unlikely that he'll collide on all of the hashes. So, but we do the same thing, hash Bob three ways, increment the values there. And then maybe Alice logs in again, and we do the same thing, we increment. So later on, we can say, how many times have we seen Alice today? <coughs> and the minimum value of the hashes of Alice gives us an upper bound on the number of times we've seen her. And once again, this whole structure is susceptible to monoidal combination with itself. So you can imagine two machines keeping separate track of the things they've seen. And we can, we can combine these two, these two data files from the two machines and, and get you know, exactly what we would have got if it had been one machine seeing the whole stream combined. In fact, this is more than a monoid. This is a full abelian group. But I'm not going to go into that. <coughs> so monoids pervade statistics, statistical computations. They give, us, uh, they give us bounded space. They give us the ability to stripe across hardware, across time. This is basically you know, map reduce is, 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 is this idea. The fact that you can have the distributed thing, distributed thing uh, working across your computation. All right. Let's talk about incremental computation. Oh, yes. <laughs> yes, I know what you're going to say. Median? Yes. Yes, median is the annoying counterexample, which is not monoidal. Um, so, so if I have machine A, it's easy for machine A to compute a median. It's easy for machine B to compute a median. But given two medians, I can't compute the median that would have been the case for the whole stream combined. Good point. Right. That's a common interview question. How do you, how do, you do medians? Um, you do it by querying the machines and kind of guessing where the median is. <laughs> it still gets you great partition points? Oh, median of medians gets you good partition points. Yeah, in fact, quicksort uses that, right? <coughs> or a median of three it uses, but yes. Um, OK. Let's look at incremental computation. So we saw that um, earlier on I gave you this example of uh, the, the function and profiling it. Function composition is associative, and it's closed. And the identity is what? The identity function, right? Um, let's let's just restrict ourselves for now to thinking about functions from one type to the same type. They're called endo functions, I think sometimes. Um, and I want to talk about std iota. Connor, Connor had std iota in his talk this morning. He didn't give it a lot of love. <laughs> I want to give it some love. It also happens to be the name of one of my pets. <laughs> so here is std iota. Now, when you look at this. Are your monoid spider senses tingling? Maybe a little, hopefully. There's a lurking monoid in here. Let's try to write iota as an accumulate to try and elucidate the structure of that monoid. So the operation that's happening here is increment. So we can do something like this. We can write iota as accumulate, something like this. It's clearly a fold-like thing. And accumulate is going to call us with the result of accumulating, uh, uh, of uh, 
dereferencing the iterator, that's our next. <coughs> Accumulate annoyingly has a rule, well, maybe not annoyingly, but, but it mustn't modify any of the elements of its range, and here we're breaking that rule, so just don't worry about that. This is technically UB, but it's for that reason, but it's just an engineering choice. std accumulate says that, but the accumulate I wrote in my other file doesn't say that. <coughs> so writing it this way makes the structure a bit clearer because we've abstracted this plus one, right? Having done that, we can pull out that plus one into a function, right? So this f here, for iota, it's plus one. If we pull it out into a function, we're beginning to see the more general structure of iota. And so this isn't iota anymore, and this function, the name I've given it is iterate. It takes an endo function, a function from one thing to the same type. And each time around the loop, it calls it on the previous result. Right? And if we, give, if we give it plus 1, then that is exactly iota. Iterate is an algorithm we don't have in the standard library, but I find it really useful sometimes. Uh, of course, iterate n, analogously, is something that I'd want. Uh, because we want the iterator count as well as the iterator pair. And we can look at this as a generalization of accumulate sort of thing. It's exposing the internal state at each iteration. Or you could think of it as a kind of partial sum that computes the input as it goes. These are all sort of variations on the theme. So if we have non std iterate, let's call it. Sorry. I think this puts a restriction oh, on move, right? This puts a restriction on move. Uh -huh. You're saying this move. For this to work. Uh, you want a thing to be able to move to itself? Well, I I you think this is undefined behavior? I don't think so. Yes. No, 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 no. So I'm, I'm, I'm moving from it. Yes, and I'm passing it to a function, yeah. and then I'm assigning. If, if, the the if the function is the identity, and if you don't allow self-assignment on move, or that goes wrong somehow, then yeah, this could bite you. Okay, I'll take, I'll take that. But otherwise, this is fine. No, but that can be continued for establish what move means. Right. Well. As of C++20, accumulate uses this very formulation. Accumulate has a move inside it, as of C++20. Gasper. So you need to know that it does and not use it, because self-assignment right. yes. is a pure vector rule. Yes, yes. So the comment is, you, you need to know that this does and not call it with identity. And in fact, when you write a move assignment operator, um, I don't think it's generally, I think, I think checking for self-assignment is not really recommended these days. Right, you're not supposed to do move assignment to self. Yeah. It also depends whether your identity is a function of identity or just the joint of the reference. Right, right. So I'm going to summarize the comments as, as always in C++, you can shoot yourself in the foot. <laughs> All right, let's think about how we would use iterate. So putting it to work. So I'm a game programmer, not anymore, but I was a game programmer. I still think of game programming. I think of procedural generation. And so that here, are some, here are some algorithms for doing maze generation. You might know some. You might recognize some from doing computer science courses. They're minimal spanning tree algorithms. So prims and cross schools are often taught. Some of these others you might have seen. You can implement any of these at your leisure. The interesting one from my point of view is Ella's algorithm because Ella's algorithm works like this. It generates the next row of the maze from the previous row. And it does that by, given that you have a row of cells unlinked to start with, let's say, you randomly link some, and you, you keep them in sets. And then you randomly uh, carve the walls down south from each set, and you get your next row. And there's something to fix up on the end, but that's not important. That's, here it is in pictures. So you start out with your row of cells in your maze, randomly carve down some walls east-west between some of them, 
and they, get, they conceptually get into the same set, then from each set, at least once, you carve south. And you get a new row where anything that, uh, you know, you just, you just put it in a new set. So seven and eight here are in new sets. And you keep going until you've had enough. Uh, everyone clear on the algorithm? Pretty simple. All right, I'm going to give you a demo. If I can, let's see if I can find. First of all, I'll show you the code. Yeah, I know what you're saying. I know what you're saying. I'm, I'm doing it. <laughs> OK, so here's my code. I'm iterating. So I just set up a row to start with. Uh, I've got, and then I iterate n times. And for when I take the row, I do that thing of, you know, for each row, to make the next row, I randomly carve east, and then I randomly carve south, and then I return the next thing. <coughs> so so that's, that's all of the code, basically, at the call site. Now, um, now I will show you that in action. Here's one I made earlier. Thank you. All right, now I'm, I'm not sure how to increase the font size here, but I can't really see. But Control Shift Plus. Thank you. All right. So I'm giving it uh, width and height arguments, or rather height and width. The first one is height. So you can see the maze comes out. Now the interesting thing is I'm just going to you know time that, uh, or rather get time to tell me the maximum memory it took. So you can see here max resident was yeah, three and a half meg, something like that. <clears throat> I don't think this is optimized, or basically. But so I can just write, you know, that was 15 rows. I can write a thousand rows. It's done that the same, the same amount resident. It's I could do a million rows, and it goes and it goes and it goes, and the projector has problem. But basically, I can keep doing that for as long as I like. It's just running iterate. It's not using any extra memory. It's just Move, 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 all the way down. And I'll probably have to, this is an old laptop. <coughs> I'll quit. Oh, there we got it. Again, you can see actually, yeah, there you go. Just over three meg max resident. The, the the term the the shape of the maze or the the bias in the maze it generates um, I am not sure yeah yeah I mean I mean this is one maze generation algorithm all the all the algorithms have different biases in the mazes they generate uh, but I chose this one as an example just because uh, because it's because it's let's get out of here because it, uh, yeah, all right, cool. Because it illustrates my idea. <laughs> so monoids give us this streaming ability. When we, when we recognize this monoidal operation and extract it out, it becomes amenable to, to using something like iterate or streaming. We get this incremental computation. And it's applicable at scale, or as I say, in the comfort of your own CPU. All right, let's talk about monoid homomorphisms. Again, a Wikipedia term. What it really means is changing one monoid into another. Now, you might think, why do this? Um, and the, thing, the example you'll find if you look at this on Wikipedia is practically always string length. So strings form a monoid under concatenation. Integers form a monoid under addition. String length gives us the change from one monoid to the other. Um, so, so what's the point of that, you say? Well, we do it all the time. Um, it's very common that we do calculations in different spaces because they're easier to think about or they're easier to calculate. Um, can anyone guess what this does? Yes, thank you. Um, I'm guessing that you saw this here. No, I think I know this one. Oh, you, you know it specifically. OK, well, I showed this to someone who didn't know it. This is an obfusc old obfuscated C thing. 
the key here is if you notice this B less than 4, and then maybe you think, well, R stands for real and I stands for imaginary. And then you can intuit that this is doing an ASCII Mandelbrot set. But how do you know that? This less than 4 is doing a comparison in the squared space of the complex numbers, right? So when you calculate the Mandelbrot set, you iterate the function. If it ever goes outside the circle of radius 2, you know it's escaped from the set. This, this isn't doing 2, this is 4. It's, it's calculating in a different space, the squared space, right? Because you know, back when this was written, square root was, was quite expensive. Um, my point is that we often do working in a different space, right? We do Fourier transformations, Laplace transformations, logarithms. They're fundamentally working in a different space. We do, you know, in game programming, we do uh, dot product calculations for basically everything. But you don't bother to do like the inverse cosine of the dot product because you know to calculate your view frustum that you just want. You know, you know the cosine value. You don't bother to inverse cosine. So here's an example. OK, this crowd knows the answer to this. What's the best way to compute the nth Fibonacci number? Someone said matrices over there. Look it up in a table. No, I want to know the millionth Fibonacci number. <laughs> so, yeah, OK. So. It's a linear recurrence relation, which means we can model it with a matrix that we raise to a power to compute the nth term. Sean has presented, I think, on this very stage, code that does that. Um, so we can look at this as a monoid homomorphism or a monoid transformation. So the Fibonacci sequence is fundamentally a function, right? And we can look at it as a function from two integers to the sliding the window to the next two integers. Now, function composition is a monoid. But we're stuck with computing it in linear time in C++. We don't have a way to easily compute compositions of functions. But we can transform that function composition monoid into a matrix multiplication monoid, and we know how to do that in logarithmic time. That's the kind of power that monoid homomorphisms give us. Now, you're probably all familiar with that example. Here's a slightly less familiar example. So a, a linear congruential random number generator, like min stood rand in the, in the standard, is fundamentally this function. It's a, it's, a, it's a function from one thing to the next thing. Function composition, we know, is a monoid. And the, the standard library has this, uh, this type, uh, this uh, function in the, in the engines. So it allows you to discard. Uh, co equivalent to you know, discarding n iterations of the random number generator. And on cppreference.com, it says, for some engines, fast jump algorithms are known. You can imagine how a fast jump could be useful in a few situations. If you're modeling something like a particle system simulation that pretty much has minimal state and spews out particles randomly, and those particles have a limited lifetime, in order to fast forward it into the future, you would want to jump n iterations of your random number generator and just run it a few cycles to get the particles out. And you just simulate a few frames to recover the entire state at that time correctly. Now, in the literature, you'll find something like this. this and you don't need to understand this in detail, but just by looking at this, so this is a linear congruential generator. And you say, here's my seed, and here's how many I want to skip. Now, what it's actually doing you can read a paper on. But we can see by looking at this that here's a while loop. Here's a shift. You can see it's a logarithmic time operation just from those two lines. So this, this is discard. Um, interestingly, I don't think this technique is implemented in any standard libraries I could find. Discard just as the linear thing. Mm -hmm. uh, but I tested this. And even for quite small numbers, this handily beats a linear time discard. <clears throat> Here's a paper if you want to go look at it. Um, and this is another example of, you know, maybe we didn't think about this in terms of monoids, but by thinking about the structure of the calculation, it can clue us in as to whether or not it's possible to transform it and what the likely gains are if we can. <clears throat> Some RNGs can be even run backwards, um, including PCG. So you can imagine this with, with a particle system or a combination of the maze generation we saw. It can give you basically random access into the future. 
Um, so, why use a homomorphism? Because there might be an easier way to calculate it in a different space. You can do more, you can do things faster or more easily. Okay, so I have a short time left, and I want to just run through a bunch of examples just to show you that monoids are ubiquitous. These are things I really didn't have time to fit in anywhere else. I only have time to scratch the surface. Any one of the things I'm going to cover could be a talk in itself. Well, in fact, the first thing I wanted to say was about reduce, it's really disappointing because reduce requires its operation to be commutative. We need in the standard something that doesn't require commutativity. I understand reduce requires commutativity for efficient vectorization. Acum yeah, but accumulate isn't, a, isn't amenable to distribution. It's not a parallel algorithm. But like, it's, a, it's, like, it's like you can't parallelize it. It's just like, you, you can parallelize it just fine if it's associative. You don't need commutativity. Right, yes. That's exactly my point. I mean, commutativity here has a good reason, which is that we know how to implement it on hardware. But I can still be sad that if I have a non-commutative operation, I can't pass it to reduce. <laughs> this, is, this is, as I said, this is data level parallelism at war with function level parallelism. OK. Um, in my talk a couple of years ago, I covered folding over tree structures. Often we handle tree-like structures. When we do have trees, it's much less likely that we see the essential computation because it's all mixed in with like traversing the tree. Um, these can be formulated just the same way we looked at IOTA and pulled out the operation. You know, that was linear. You can do that on the tree structure too. Um, you get that separation of control for, from, flow from logic. You can often use a, a monoid, an accumulate style, a reduce style operation on a tree. And the key to that is, um, the key to think about folding over trees is to think of linear sequences as trees. So in functional languages, they're often uh, modeled by a variant, basically, of, uh, you know, a vector can be either the empty vector or an element and the vector tail. <coughs> And accumulate, therefore, takes effectively two arguments to mirror the two possibilities of a vector. The first argument in it deals with the fact when you've got an em the case when you've got an empty vector. The second argument deals with the case when you've got a vector with something in it. So if you look at accumulate this way, and you know, reduce fold this way, um, then you can see how to apply it to trees. Um, because if you look at the vector as a as, as a tree or a variant in that sense. So it can be extended. I covered that in my talk a couple of years ago. Uh, some of the code in that talk wasn't particularly modern as we might write it now, but there's, a, there's an idea there. Um, oh, yeah, I'm going to put in the plug for P0847 because um, having overload or recursively, recursive lambda overload sets really helps with, with visiting trees. <coughs> Talking of visiting trees, you might say, well, how is accumulating over a tree different from just visiting? And the answer is, in fact, I got this question in that talk, I think. The answer is it's different in the same way that accumulate is different from for each. You can achieve the effect of accumulate with for each. But what you're giving up is the expressivity, the declarative style. You're, you have to manage state. Uh, when you use an accumulation, an equivalent accumu accumulation over a tree, you get that declarative style back. You get that uh, lack of managing state. All right. Uh, futures can be viewed as monoids. <coughs> uh, and one operation where they, where they form monoids is the when any operation. So you're racing two futures together. So we can see that it's associative. And the it has an identity. And the identity is what? The future that never completes, right? And this might be useful for modeling cancellation. Imagine you have a UI, and you kick off the user, you know, clicks a button, kicks off some long-running computation, and you could model that. And then there's a cancel button, right? You could model the cancel, but the pressing of the cancel button as a future that you race against the completion of the computation. And that gives you a monoidal way to, to model cancellation in a futures context. 
Waiting for yes, when waiting for all for oh for all is also monoidal. Uh, quite possibly yes, yeah yeah they're equivalent to, I think to and and all you know they're they're the analogous to and and all so when all with the future that immediately compu uh, completes is also a monoid. Uh, parsers are monoids uh, under alternation, and Jason and I use this for our talk about um, where we parse JSON at compile time in 2017 <coughs> with parser combinators. And this kind of alternation can be, can be used to provide error messages. Um, if you put the, the error parser, the parser that always fails at the end of this, but fails with an error message, that's one way to provide an error message. <coughs> Again, talking about statistics, but not in terms of uh, you know, counting uniques or something. Uh, training sets are often are often applic uh, applicable to to monoids. Uh, now I don't know very much about machine learning, but one one example here is at this blog post. You, let's say you have a large set of data you train on it. It's very expensive to train, and then the next day you get more data in. Well, that's an incremental thing. Anytime you have an incremental thing, you could look for a monoid because it will give you that incremental uh, computation ability. So training on a large set gives you some distribution. Maybe you can train on a small set and find a way to combine the distributions and have it be as if you had trained on the entire set. But instead of having to retrain on the large set, you've only trained on the incremental part. Regular expressions are, are monoids. I'm sure in more ways than this. But again, there's, a, there's a, an article that you can read at your leisure. So the situation here is you have a regular expression, you have a body of text you want to match, and then so you perform the match, and then you say you edit the string, you want to perform the match again. There's a way to represent this using, I think, finger trees, which mutable red black trees can do the same job. <coughs> and it gives you that incremental the ability to match incrementally because you've changed the thing incrementally. Anytime you're getting an incremental or a distributed computation, you should look for a monoid. All right, finally, a game I like to play with functional programmers. And I sometimes play it with myself or my colleagues. So I will say, x is a monoid. Note the loose language. I'm not saying x is a monoid under some operation. And then the functional programmer says, oh, they're all interested. Oh, you mean in the sense of, of this? And then I say, yeah, up to isomorphism. <laughs> and this game works because almost everything is a monoid under some interpretation. And the functional programmer will do the work for you. <laughs> you can construct a free monoid for any set, yes. OK, so I hope I've shown examples and sort of piqued your curiosity and maybe given you an intuition for when to look for monoids and, and what they can do and the, the benefits they give. <coughs> so in particular, to recap on the benefits, they help you. Uh, separate control flow from your business logic, and um, they're ubiquitous, and, and they, are, they are beyond numerics, which is a way we're often used to thinking about them, and they will give you the ability to do distributed and or incremental computation. And that's my talk. Thank you. Uh, Connor, yes. Oh, right. So, uh, fantastic talk. Um, you've like articulated and put names to a structure that's been floating in my head. Um, so my, I have a comment and a question. My first comment is uh, your iterate is basically, or can be thought of as a numeric generate. So, so right. stood right. generate is a function that basically does the same thing. Um, and you could implement it the same way if you basically just initialize a value in your capture list of your lambda and then increment it. Yeah, st so st generate, yes. So generate and iota are very similar. And, and yes, you, uh, the advantage of iterate is that um, it pulls the, it, it, it's declarative, right? Yes. So, so you'd, you'd have if to you use generate, line. you have to capture something in the lambda and make the lambda mutable. Same thing we saw with iota, so yes. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And then my question is, um, when it comes to free monoids um, and things you would do in, in functional programming, uh, you mentioned that you know it's not really like 
the compiler can't see through that. Is is it possible? I haven't thought about this, but is it possible that in the future, like that kind of programming could take advantage of like return value optimization due to the fact that really you're just like appending to a string or something? And like, is is that possible or something that we could do in C plus uh, plus? Or do you know? I I don't know. Uh, there are two. So there are. I think there are two things there. One is. Is the compiler smart enough to see it? But the other question is: Is the compiler allowed to align things that might that might occur in in doing it the other way? And I don't know the answer to either of those questions. Okay. Well, but maybe but there's a compiler person. Maybe here there's that, a compiler person does. who who would. Chandler's shaking his head. He doesn't want any part of that. <laughs> uh, can you go back to the color example? Oh, yes. Maybe it's many slides, but I will start talking while you search. I think I, I like that you separate default mm -hmm. construction from identity under certain oh. operation. I think it was here. So the yes. Yes, I like that you separate both things because, yes. in my opinion, what default constructor gives you mathematically is even some is something deeper, which is whether you believe in the axiom of choice for that type or for that set. Interesting. Uh, because and this is not just theoretical, because if you pass uh, just the type to a function, it, it knows where to start. Right. Because you don't need to pass an op operation, or you can pass an operation that you don't know any property about. And you can st start with an element, and mm -hmm. you can start iterating with that element. But if you, if you don't have a default constructor, you don't know where to start. And that's basically you telling any function that you don't believe in the axiom of choice for that set. OK. Interesting interpretation, yeah. Thanks, Marshall. Whoa! <laughs> 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 okay. A bit silly, really. Whose idea but, uh, was it to get that mic? <laughs> just want to let you know I uh, took your advice about uh, trolling functional programming friends by dropping in my company Slack um, the assertion that a hot dog is a monoid. And uh, All right. now my functional programming coworkers are explaining uh, the ways in which uh, sandwiches are, in fact, monoids because you can concat them and it's still a sandwich. Yes. Hot dogs, they're still figuring sandwiches out. Sandwiches are monoids. I knew yeah. that was why I like sandwiches so, so much. Great advice. Love it. Thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you very much for listening. Find me later if you want to talk more. <laughs>